is Meghan Markle a narcissistic sociopath? That is what her own staff labeled her in these latest excerpts we got from Valentine Lowe, who is the royal editor for the Times of London. He has explained that Meghan Markle was basically kind of the boss from hell. And her staff members ha basically had PTSD and collectively named themselves the Sussex Survivor Squad. Hello everyone, welcome to Royal News Network. My name is Brittany and today we are gonna be discussing the latest excerpts from Valentine Lowe and his upcoming book on the Royal Courtiers. And in particular, although there's not a ton of new information here, what I absolutely love though is that how we have this official confirmation that Meghan Markle's staff basically saw her as a narcissistic sociopath. She was bat crap crazy basically is how they labeled her from lying about the provenance of diamonds b these blood diamonds that she had to kind of all you know her and harry doing mexit and basically just letting go of all their staff even though they had been loyal and working for them harry and megan cared about little but themselves and making money and these latest excerpts make it abundantly clear how megan markle used and abused the position that harry gave her through marriage to increase her own bank account at the expense of others. But if you guys haven't been here to Royal News Network before, on this channel we provide very compelling commentary about the latest royal news and gossip. In addition, we talk about television shows, movies, and history. So if you guys wanna hit that subscribe button, that would be fantastic. I am actually starting a separate channel that will be all about royal fashion and jewelry. So if you guys are interested in that, feel free to, I'll put that description below if you wanna follow the link and subscribe there as well. I will have videos launching in October. But like I said, the boss from hell is Meghan Markle. Apparently, she is awful to deal with. And she just made her staff's life very, very difficult, basically from the jump. And we went over that in the previous video that was uploaded last night. But today we are going to be talking about kind of the other bit of news that we are getting about kind of Valentine Lowe from Valentine Lowe and just all these other things about how just awful she can really B. So without further ado, let's go over the first excerpts here. Nevertheless, Harry had looked out of sorts. So this was on when they were on their South Pacific tour of Australia and New Zealand. Harry and Meghan, the, the, sta the press were with them on their plane. And at one point, you know, usually the royals go back and talk to the members of the press. We heard that Catherine and William did this and then they actually had a, a great time and did a great job chatting with the royal reporters after they went through this very, very kind of violent storm and there was a lot of turbulence. And so Catherine and William went back, chatted with the reporters about it, kind of had this very, very nice time. And those little interactions go a long way in providing very good positive coverage. But Harry just wasn't having that. Nevertheless, Harry had looked out of sorts. His relations with the media pack had been prickly and strained. Where Meghan smiled, always putting her best face whenever she was on show, Harry glowered. On the five-hour flight back from Tonga to Sydney, his press handlers promised that he would come and thank the media for being there. It was only after the plane had landed that the couple finally appeared. I think that's very key that they said when Meghan is on. There's, there's no, Megan has this facade and I actually did a video on this. I don't actually think I redid it because when I did it, it was like kind of when I was first starting the channel and when I watched it again, I felt like, oh, my energy's off. It just doesn't look quite as good. So I wanted to do kind of this face she'll put on this mask, her duchessing look. She, she She's duchessing when she has this look on her face. She's trying to be a duchess because she doesn't know what she is, so she, she fakes it. So I had done a video on that and I hadn't been able to complete it, but I like too how he was on that flight and he noticed that yes, she has this mask she puts on where she tries to act as genteel as she can and as graceful as she can because again, she's faking it. I remember the scene well, this is Valentine. Harry looked like a sulky teenager Major. Megan stood behind him, smiling benignly. That's her duchessing look, her, her fakeness. Her only contribution was a comment about how much everyone must be looking forward to Sunday lunch at home. Harry sounded rushed, as if he couldn't wait to get back to, into the first class cabin. Thanks for coming, he said, even though you weren't invited. This was spectacularly rude and incorrect. The media had been invited to cover the tour. Later, Harry's staff told him how badly his remarks had gone down. He replied, well, you shouldn't have made me do it. Harry's petulant behavior revealed much about the couple's deteriorating relationship with their own staff. Again, 
Harry, that was just incredibly stupid of Harry. Of course the media were invited to cover it. What else were they supposed to do? How else are they supposed to know about your tour? You ding dong? <laughs> I mean, really? Harry, I mean, just, just the denseness of this. Like, how else are they supposed to know? How else are they supposed to cover it? What is Harry thinking? Again, and it's just so incredibly stupid. And I can't imagine, you know, as Megan letting him say something that idiotic to staff members who are just going to report it. And again, this established this contentious, combative relationship that Harry and Meghan would have with the press for still to this day, there is very much a tense, combative relationship, mostly on Harry and Meghan's part because they hate the press so much that they feel this constant need to attack it. And that just doesn't do anybody any favors. So bad did things eventually become that Harry and Meghan's team would later refer to themselves as the Sussex Survivors club. The core members were Sam Cohen, whom the queen had personally asked to step in as private secretary and who worked for the couple from their wedding until the end of their South Africa tour in September 2019. Sarah Latham, the former Freud's PR managing partner, hired in 2019 to be in charge of communications, and assistant press secretary Marnie Gaffney. Sources say the team came up with a damaging epaulette for Megan, a narcissistic sociopath. They also reportedly said on a repeated occasions, we were played. Yes, they were. Meghan Markle didn't care about the monarchy. She doesn't really care about Harry, in my opinion. She doesn't care about his family, his reputation, his life, really anything. Meghan's sole desire is fame and money. Those are the two things that dominate her mindset. So she saw the royal family not as a way to make a great impact on the world, although she says that, it was a way for her to make buttloads of cash. That's what she wanted. And she wanted this fame and fortune that was denied to her because she was a really crappy actress and she refused to work on her craft. Ergo, nobody would hire her for any decent part. You know, because at some point, although you can be a pretty face, you have to actually be good at acting to get decent acting roles. That's how the kind of the world works in this situation, but she refused to do that. On October 2nd, shortly before the start of the tour, the journalist and dissident Jamal Khashoggi was murdered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. So this is talking about Harry and Meghan are on their tour of the South Pacific region and Meghan debuts these huge diamond earrings. And I remember thinking at the time, they said they were borrowed and I was like, royals don't borrow earrings from jewelers, especially British royals. They have enough of their own, other families, sure. But the Brits? Didn't make a ton of sense, but of course we found out the real reason. The event became a major news story with accusations that the Crown Prince had personally ordered the killing. The idea that Meghan would then, at a state occasion, wear earrings given to her by a man accused of having blood on his hands was surprising to say the very least. Meghan's staff were bemused that she should wear them. The Kensington Palace briefing that the earrings were loaned was misleading. But who was responsible? Cohen told colleagues at the time that the earrings had been borrowed from the jeweler Chopin. Hard. It was not true. So Megan wore these earrings and told her team to tell the press that they were borrowed. They weren't borrowed. They were from the Saudi crown prince who is accused of being involved in the murder of a journalist. That's very, very serious. And as somebody who supposedly cares about humanitarian issues, wouldn't Megan be aware of that and and aware of that maybe wearing those those pieces of jewelry wouldn't be a good idea. Of course, she lied to her staff members and then made them fools because then they lied to the press. Of course, it took a couple years, but these kind of things, they, they do hit the surface after a while. Three weeks later, Meghan gave the earrings a second outing at Buckingham Palace at the 70th birthday party for Charles, then Prince of Wales. At that time, Cohen still appeared to be under the impression that they had been loaned by Chopard. However, others knew the truth. When they had first appeared in the media after the Fiji dinner, staff in London responsible for registering details of all royal gifts had recognized them and alerted Kensington Palace. A source said, we made a decision not to confront Harry and Meghan on it out of fear of what their reaction would be. After the Duchess wore the earrings for a second time, an aide decided to take it up with Harry. He is said to have looked shocked that people knew where the earrings came from, although the Sussex lawyers had denied he ever questioned their prominence. Okay, and this right here, golly, Harry is a stupid guy. Man alive. Did he not think that nobody was keeping track of the gifts? I mean, come on. They knew where they came from. I kind of wonder if there is this set of jewelry, although it was rumored to have come from Charles, but it's this diamond and ruby set 
that Catherine has only worn one time and the necklace looks like it could have been turned into a tiara. Catherine's never debuted it again. She wore it once, I think, in 2011, and that's been the extent of her wearing it. And there's, you know, and I wonder if perhaps that even was a gift from Saudi Arabia, and that's why she doesn't wear it anymore. She also has this gorgeous emerald set that we've seen the earrings of, and I think maybe she has a bracelet attached to it as well. And could those also be from Saudi Arabia? Is that why we haven't seen those since 2015 or 16? It's unclear. But Catherine also, I'm sure, got jewelry from Saudi Arabia. And again, the, the Waleses are very, very cautious about how they wear and when they wear those type of pieces. In February 2021, Megan's lawyers, Schilling, said, and no stage did the Duchess tell staff that the earrings were borrowed from a jeweler, as this would have been untrue. And therefore, any suggestion that she encouraged them to lie to the media is baseless. Then two days later, Schilling said, the Duchess is certain that she never said the earrings were borrowed from a jeweler. And it's possible she said the earrings were borrowed, which is correct, as pres presents from heads of state to the royal family are gifts to Her Majesty the Queen, who can then choose to lend them out to members of the family. But that is not convincing. If the earrings were loaned by the queen, the staff would have said so. And no one in normal conversation would ever have referred to them as being loaned. They were a wedding gift for Megan. And again, her constant need to kind of lie and kind of, she, you know, she's clearly trying to correct her mistake here. And I was like, how dumb are you? Come on now. Seriously. I mean, you just look at all this and go, were you not aware that this could be a possible, like, were you not aware that people could figure this out? That like, you can't keep this secret forever and that everybody's not going to follow the party line just because you're Meghan Markle and he's Prince Harry. I mean, they have higher people there in authority too. And the staff members can only report what you tell them. She's clearly doubling back because she's like, their, her lawyers are like, yeah, people aren't buying that because of course they're not buying it. But Megan. I just, I don't get this constant need she has to lie about stupid things she doesn't need to lie about. And although this is huge, she should have just admitted, I didn't want to admit they were from the Saudi prince. And like, people would have maybe gotten over it, but it's a lying and then telling everybody else that they're crazy for going, well, you clearly lied. And she's like, well, no, 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 no. Why would I tell them? I mean, it's all their fault. I'm like, they can always, they, they don't know where they came from, only you do. Again, just, craziness. Megan's lawyers also argued that she had no idea about Sheikh Mohammed's involvement in Kasaji's murder. However, Megan once told a gathering for International Women's Day that she read The Economist because she sought out journalism that's really covering things that are going to make an impact. Between mid-October and early November 2018, The Economist ran at least two articles examining the role of Sheikh Mohammed in Kasaji's murder. So again, Either Megan's lying about reading The Economist or she's lying about knowing about the murders because she wanted to wear massive diamonds. Yeah, like, duh. <laughs> Come on now. Like, again, you just, for Pete's sake, it's like either you don't read The Economist, and I could totally see Megan saying she reads The Economist and not really reading The Economist. I could totally see that because she just wants the accolades for supposedly reading something intellectual. That's what she wants in these kind of situations. She wants the prestige of reading a magazine like that without actually reading it. I've read The Economist. I actually really enjoy it. I actually have a couple of comic things from The Economist that I love and because they're really, really sharp. But I haven't read it recently. I haven't read it in a while. And sometimes I bought them to read them and I never ended up reading them to be totally honest. But hey, I can be honest about that. Megan, for some reason, just can't seem to be honest about anything. <laughs> another reason for her premature departure did not emerge until two years later. So moving on, another part of the South Pacific tour that kind of really got a lot of press attention was her departure, early departure from this marketplace in Fiji. And obviously it's come out that Megan saw this UN women sign and she was enraged because UN women wouldn't give her the prominent place she thought she deserved on their team or whatever. Or No, the UN did not make her like a goodwill ambassador or something. So she was furious. So if she saw any UN women paraphernalia anywhere at this market, she, she was going to leave. Why? I still don't understand. Like, come on, just be an adult, be a grown up, and move on. But again, if she is a narcissistic psychopath, she can't handle it if somebody does not love 
the visage that is Meghan Markle. Another reason for her premature departure did not emerge until two years later, when I was told that it was because Meghan was concerned about the presence of the UN Women Group, which she had previously worked with. The Duchess had earlier told staff that she would go only if there was no UN Women branding, a source said. Before Meghan arrived at the market, staff did their best to reduce the visibility of the group. However, footage of the visit shows Meghan surrounded by women in blue tops bearing the UN Women logo. At one point, the Duchess, with a fixed smile, can be heard whispering to a member of staff who grimaced. Megan told an aide, I can't believe I've been put in this situation. Moments later, she was ushered out. A staffer remarked at the time, that's insane. She is nuts. One stallholder said, it is such a shame. We started preparing for the visit three weeks ago, but she left without even saying hello. Afterwards, the staff member whom Megan spoke to at the market was seen sitting in an official car, tears streaming down her face. And this could have been most likely, I mean, and this most likely was Amy Pickerel. We actually do, we don't have a picture of it, but we do see Megan kind of pulling her aside and whispering to her. And of course, Megan, she's faking it. She's furious, but she's got a smile on her face and is not looking it, which again shows you the fakeness that is Meghan Markle. The coverage, including the headline, Pregnant Duchess Rush from Marketplace as Crowds Close In, caused massive consternation within Scotland Yard. The Metropolitan Police suggested flying out an officer to ensure she was being protected properly. Despite privacy assurance, assurances from Kensington Palace that the incident had nothing to do with security. So again, Megan is causing massive problems with, you know, people who have real big girl jobs and people are misinterpreting her narcissistic behavior for real con security concerns. So these have big ramifications. And again, she makes Fiji look bad. She, I mean, she's a horrible ambassador. She, she was a horrifically bad royal, like really, really bad. The Duchess's head of security resigned from the Met a few months later. Why did the Duchess now appear to want to distance herself from UN women? The reason is not known. In 2015, when she was an actress in Suits, Megan had accepted an invitation to be a UN women advocate for women's political participation and leadership. But by 2018, she appeared less happy to be associated with the group. Her lawyer told the Times in 2021, this is completely false. The Duchess is a keen supporter of UN women and has never objected to their branding. The only reason the Duchess was evacuated from the event was due to safety concerns. This was a decision made by her head of security she met with other leaders from UN Women later in the South Pacific tour. Again, Megan just wanted to be exceptionally difficult and just really wanted, like, if there are things don't, she's the boss from hell when things don't go her way. And even th when things do go her way, they're just never good enough for her, if you get my drift. Two years later, Megan's narrative would once again be at odds with the memory of those who once worked with her. In her famous interview with Oprah Winfrey in March 2021, Megan takes pains to highlight the difference between the queen and those who surrounded her. In Megan's account, they were the people who refused to help when she was in her hour of greatest need. They were the ones who perpetrated falsehoods about her. So Megan again was trying to reframe this disastrous tenure as a royal under the, you know, nobody helped her. And she was under, you know, great mental strain and crisis. But as he goes on, he explains that a lot of what she did kind of made no sense. And I'll explain a bit why. So watching Megan describe how she considered ending her life in the year after her marriage was an uncomfortable experience. And yet, a succession of perfectly decent people, all of whom believed in Megan and wanted to make it work, came to be so disillusioned that they began to suspect that even her most heartfelt pleas for help were a part of a deliberate strategy that had one end in sight, her departure from the royal family. They believed she wanted to be able to say, look how they failed to support me. And I completely see this. Megan's talking about the Cirque du Soleil performance that she went to and that she looked gray in some of the pictures and her friends noticed. She said this in the Oprah Winfrey interview, and I just remember looking, you look thrilled as punch to be there. Harry looked thunderous, but he always does anymore. But you looked fine. I don't see you looking great. In fact, you're walking around in Stuart Weitzman heels that, you know, are this tall. You're telling me you wanted to end your life and that you're very mentally imbalanced, that you're teetering around on these very tall heels. I mean, that's not to say that she could have been having an issue. But again, it's like, if you're having a really hard time, if you're having a real 
issued, the palace will take you out of that. They have no problem rescheduling things if that's a particular situation. What I found very telling in the Oprah Winfrey interview is that Harry admitted he didn't ask for help from his family when Meghan told him about this grand plan she had to end her life, apparently, that she never really, that she never carried out. What I found myself thinking is that Harry didn't tell his family, perhaps because he knew, maybe not in the front of his mind, but maybe in the back, that it was a manipulation strategy. He's not the brightest guy, but sometimes, you know, your intuition tells you something. And I think a lot of people knew if they had heard this at the time, just kind of went, I, I'm sorry, but I just don't totally buy it. Not to mention the fact that if she was in severe crisis, there are a multitude, I'm sure, of very, very discreet doctors that are on staff with the royals that could have helped her immediately with her crisis. That she decided not to ask them, and as we'll see, turn to the head of HR for the palace, which makes literally no sense whatsoever, is all apparently part of a ploy to get out of being a royal so she can finally try to make it in Hollywood. Sam Cohen, who had 17 years experience of working at the palace, would frequently say to Edward Young, the Queen's private secretary, and Clive Alderton, Charles's private secretary, that if it all went wrong, the palace needed evidence of the duty of care it had shown to Harry and Meghan. The duty of care was crucial. Sam was a broken record with them on that. So Harry and Meghan's staff knew that Harry and Meghan probably wanted their way out and that they were going to say that, well, nobody offered us any help. So Sam Cohen was saying, you guys need to have the receipts. So you try to help them because Harry and Meghan have, especially Meghan, has no ability to feel empathy or to try and actually you know, she's willing to throw the institution completely under the bus to get her way and to promote herself. That's what she's willing to do. And you have to be there to protect yourselves from that. And I think this comes in a situation later. It's like they didn't know what to do with somebody who just didn't want to be happy. Megan did not want to be happy. She wanted an excuse to leave. She wanted an excuse to try to become a billionaire. And I love that William is now technically a billionaire and she is not, not great. But she wanted her way out because she wanted to be this Hollywood star she could never be. And she was immediately, she was so incredibly frustrated that she actually had to meet people that she didn't care to meet, that she had to actually talk to the public, who she didn't care about. Because who did she care about? George and Mal Clooney. She cared about Oprah Winfrey. She didn't care about the people of Australia, New Zealand, Tonga, Fiji, you, the United Kingdom, Canada, you know, wherever in the rest of the world that she went, South Africa, she didn't care about them. She cared about Hollywood celebrity. That is her entire driving force. And said Megan was able to point out all of the times the institution had failed her. This was in the Oprah Winfrey interview. One of them was when she went to the head of HR, where she was given a sympathetic hearing, but was sent on her way. This was inevitable. HR is there to deal with employee issues not members of the royal family. Megan would presumably have known that. So what was she doing there? Laying a trail of evidence would be the cynical answer. Another former staff member goes even further. Everyone knew that the institution would be judged by her happiness, they say. The mistake they made was thinking that she wanted to be happy. She wanted to be rejected because she was obsessed with that narrative from day one. One, and again, we've heard this quote before and I think it's incredibly telling that Megan did not want to be happy. She did not want to be accepted. She didn't even want to try because she did not care. She didn't care. She got this incredible opportunity to be part of this amazing family in history and she did not care because they want to give her the starring role. And of course, she's always been on the hunt her entire life for her starring role. And the view of another insider, one of Megan's concerns was whether she was going to be able to earn money for herself given her position in the royal family. Although Megan was not making money out of the deals her US agents were negotiating at the time, she did the voiceover for a Disney wildlife documentary in return for a charitable donation, some suspected that in the end, she wanted to make money. And the only way she could do that was by leaving her royal life behind and going back to America. Again, money, 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 money. All Megan cares about, because that's why we see her every single time we see her, she's in brand spanking clothes worth tens of thousands of dollars. And what's funny is that when the queen died, guess what she did? 
she wore a repeat. Like her, the first repeat we've really seen her in, in a couple years she wore to part of the Queen's Lying in State ceremony. So again, it shows you how she thinks about the royal family is that she only busts out her old stuff when it's, it's a queen and she doesn't really care. Part of the problem, according to one source, was that everyone in the palace was too genteel and civil. When someone decides to not be civil, they have no idea what to do. They were run over by her and run over by Harry. Again, we've heard this quote before, but I think it's worth repeating because if somebody's not just going to meet you part way, if they're not even going to try, if their entire goal is to take down the institution, what do you do? What do you do? I totally feel for her staff members. They had no clue what to do. And that's incredibly challenging because it's like, you're just trying to deal with a normal person and she's a raging psychopath. She is a raging narcissistic psychopath and there is just no middle ground. You can't negotiate with terrorists and that's basically what Megan was. There was no negotiating, there was no compromise with her because it was her way or the highway and if you got between her and money and fame, she would steamroll you, she would try to destroy you because that was, again, all she ever wanted was somebody to think of her as the star she always was when her, in her own head. The situation was not helped by Harry and Meghan's deteriorating relationship with Alderton and Young. As things started to go wrong, a source told royal biographer Robert Lacey, Meghan came to perceive Young as the inflexible bureaucratic figure who summed up what was wrong with the Buckingham Palace mentality. And the feeling was mutual. Young really came to dislike Meghan's style. Harry was just as dismissive of the two senior courtiers as Meghan. An insider said he used to send them horrible emails. So rude. And again, this, this petulant, narcissistic, damaging behavior Harry and Meghan exhibited gave them no friends, has given them no favors. And so now that they are on the outside looking in, there is no support for them. There is no love for them. There is no protection of them. They will be thrown to the wolves. That's why all these books are coming out because the palace is saying, we have absolutely no incentive to protect you here. If everybody wants to make bullying allegations, if they want to reveal the worst parts about your life, we know it damages us too, but we want you exposed even more than we want to protect ourselves. We want people to know who you really are, that this genteel smile you give the public is utterly and completely false. When Harry and Meghan went to Canada for their six week break in November, 2019, their escape plans were already laid. Amid the greatest secrecy, Meghan would not even tell their nanny, Lauren, where they were going. According to one source, she did not know where they were going until the plane, a private jet, was in the air. Again, this could have been maybe Tyler Perry. I don't think it was Tyler Perry's private jet. Could have been Tyler Perry's private jet. We don't know quite because these are excerpts. But again, it goes to show that Harry and Meghan were completely willing to play this cloak and dagger thing with people who were just genuinely trying to help them. They seem to just spit on the any hand that tried to help them that was not drowning in money. <laughs> And basically what happened. Shortly before the end of the year, Megan confided in a member of her staff that the couple were not coming back. The rest of the team did not find out until a, they held a meeting at Buckingham Palace at the beginning of November 2020. They found it hard to accept that they were being dumped just like that. Some of them were in tears. It was a very loyal team, said one. You know, I didn't talk about this in my last video and I wanted to make sure I did. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Because you know what, I'm, I don't believe in karma, but what I do believe is that your actions have a reaction. They have an impact. And you know what, if you treat people poorly, that will reflect on you someday. Maybe not immediately, maybe not in a couple months, a year or two, but if you treat people like they are the scum of the earth, if you treat them as less than human, less than the dignity they deserve, that will come back to you. And I think we've seen that with Harry and Meghan. And that's why I also wanted to say, and I don't think I, I did a live stream, I don't think I ex explained it well there, that on this channel, I always want everybody to interact with each other kindly. Even if you like Harry and Meghan, you are welcome here. You are absolutely welcome here. And I will, you know, even people have said rude things or they've said, you know, hey, I really like Meghan. I will still give you a thumbs up. If you come at it with just a very kind of considered response or just saying, I still really like her. I'm like, hey, more power to you. Absolutely. I don't want this to ever become a place that's toxic because A, I don't like it. And B, I don't think it helps anything. It doesn't 
help us when we try to share the realities of who Megan actually is. And I think at the end of the day, truth usually does win. And I think that's what what's happening with Harry and Megan. She thought that, you know, that she's the most charming, compelling, charismatic person in the room. But you know what? At the end of the day, people do talk. And if you treat people badly, that does come out. That cannot be hidden forever. And Megan's horrible treatment of staff is completely coming back to bite her in the rear. And these stories will not stop. I mean, some of it's regurgitated that we've heard before, but the more people tell them, the less Megan's grip on this narrative that the only reason people don't like her is because of the color of her skin is diminished. Because the reason why people don't like her is apparently, according to her own staff, people who know her better than most of the public, she is a narcissistic sociopath who cares for nothing but money and fame. So guys, let me know what you think of this video. Let me know if you think of Valentine Lowe's latest book. I don't know if I can't, things move so fast though, I can't remember. But I will be reaching out to his publishing team, hopefully getting an advanced copy, or uh, I'll be hopefully getting a copy as soon as they release it. And then also I'll request an interview with Valentine. It didn't work with Tom Bauer, but maybe it'll work with Valentine. My subscriber base has gone from 10,000 when I asked Tom Bauer to at least 42,000 now, hopefully 43,000. And so with a higher number count and more views, I'm hoping, hoping, hoping that he says yes to an interview. I would love to start actually interviewing these royal authors because I've said this before and I know I'm a broken record. I do want to start a book club doing like a book a month and we have a lot coming up. We have Angela Levine's book on Camilla and I want to reach out to her and her publishing team too. And so hopefully we can maybe start getting on a better track because I'd love to interview the author and then have a live stream that people can kind of discuss the book and what they liked about it. But I'm still working on that. Got to launch the fashion site first. Got to launch the fashion page first. Yes, so, so much going on. Thank you guys so much for all your support and love. This is really a fantastic community. Not saying that anything is bad at all, but I just want to make sure we can keep it that way. Let's always try to be positive and kind to each other. Thank you so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.